Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. Today we have a pleasure to, to host uh, Adrian Sholimos from Etofos University in Budapest. So Adrian is a, a PhD student of colleague, colleague of ours, Zoltan Zimboyash, and Adrian works on like intersection of group theory, mathematical physics, entanglement theory. And today he'll be telling us about like some new results they got on extendability of quantum states. Thanks for joining us, Adrian. The screen is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so, as Mihao said, uh, yeah, the, my title, the title of my talk is "Extendability of Quantum States." I will um, sometimes say "Shareability of Quantum States," but we will get into that. I'm, of course, Adrian Shoimos or Solimos, however you want it. And what I'm presenting right now is a work with uh, Zoltan Simborash and David Jakob, uh, who are my colleagues, and Zoltan is my supervisor. And we, we all three of us work from Budapest, uh, from Wigner and, uh, and Elte. Okay, so let's, let's get in. Uh, this is the outline of my talk, so that you have something to look, look forward to, to, so that you can imagine what will happen. Firstly, I will talk just like a few moments about entanglement to give you some motivation uh, to get to the, the, the main topic, which is extendability and shareability. And then I will switch it up a bit um, to and talk about states with symmetries, because as Mihao mentioned, I, I like group theory, I like symmetries. And uh, the reason that we will do that is because this uh, extendability or shareability that I will introduce um, is, uh, an, can be calculated for states with symmetry um, most of the time or, or, or many, many times. And that's why we're interested in states with symmetry. And then I will talk about some results. So these three points about, are about results. I have some results for Werner-like uh, states. And we will see what I mean by that. I have results for um, O states or orthogonal states uh, and the Werner states as well. And then I'll, I'll end by citing some sources. Okay, so let's get into it. Some entanglement, some motivation, but this is very basic. Uh, as every one of you know, if we have a bipartite state on a bipartite Hilbert space, it can either be uncorrelated or correlated. If it's uncorrelated, it's really easy. It's a product state uh, and you can take the marginals. So you can basically forget about one of the Hilbert spaces and uh, look at the other one and you will get back uh, the marginals uh, of, you, you will get back the, the products in the, or, or the, the factors in the product state. That's really easy. Uh, and yes, of course, you can have correlated states, on the other hand, and they can either be separable states, where you can imagine that you're having a sort of classical correlation, or you can have entangled states, uh, which have a funny definition, they are the non-separable states. Now, entangled states are like the most important topic, I think, in quantum information theory. Uh, we're very interested in entanglement um, for, for a lot of different reasons. It can be used, for example, as a resource in, um, in quantum protocols. And therefore, it's uh, one of the, the important ideas to be able to measure entanglement and to quantify uh, the entanglementedness, I guess, of a state. Uh, so we have uh, entanglement measures to do that for us. Uh, for a pure state, for example, so for a, a state on a bipartite Hilbert space, which is pure, uh, we have a very good entanglement measure that everybody understands well. It's the entanglement entropy, whereby you calculate the von Neumann entropy of one of the marginals. It will be the same for either marginal. And this is a, is, is a, is a really good measure of entanglement. Now, what happens if you have a mixed state? So, of course, uh, the other side of, uh, of states or the other, side, other type of categorization of states is that you can either have pure states or mixed states. And uh, for mixed states, it's a bit more tricky. You can do, for example, the entanglement of formation, whereby you're using entanglement entropy, but you're using it in a tricky way. If you have a mixed state, you can uh, actually uh, uh, write it up as a sum of, uh, of uh, pure states, as a convex sum of pure states. But this can happen in many different ways. So you can do this in many different ways. And what is required when you're calculating the entanglement of formation is to write it up in all of the possible uh, ways and then look at uh, the entanglement entropy of these uh, pure factors 
and sum them up, you get numbers and you get a big, big set, like a huge set, and you look at the smallest or the actually the, the infimum of the set, and that will give you the entanglement of formation. As you can imagine, this is uh, this is very hard to do in a general way. So this is in incredibly difficult unless you have very special cases. Uh, another one that you can do is very similar. You can you can uh, use the Schmidt number to characterize entanglement. Uh, again, for a for a mixed state, you can actually uh, look at the decomposition of the mixed state into uh, the sum of a convex sum of pure states, and for each pure state, you can look at its Schmidt number or Schmidt rank. Uh, for uh, each of these, you look at what what's the biggest one. You get a set with lots of numbers, and you look at the the smallest one, the minimal one, for every decomposition, and that will be the Schmidt number of this mixed state. Again, uh, this is very hard. These are called, by the way, uh, I think convex roof. Um, 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 constructions. Now these are difficult to calculate in general. So uh, the, the, this is the motivation to uh, uh, introduce a new type of entanglement measure, which is the shareability number or extendability number. And this is where I get into extendability and shareability. So of course, uh, there are different ways to write it. Sometimes people miss the E, but I won't. I prefer having it with the E, but then that's, by the way, a normal uh, type of writing to write it without an E. Okay, so what's shareability? Imagine that someone has given you a state, which is a bipartite state, it's row AB. Now, uh, I will firstly talk about one, two shareability, and it will become very apparent what one, two means in this case. So you can ask if someone has given you a state, can you find a new state on a larger Hilbert space in which you have uh, one of the copies of the well, the first Hilbert space, like HA in this case, and you have two copies of HB, which I label HB1 and HB2. So you're trying to find on a larger Hilbert space, you're trying to find uh, a quantum state such that any marginal which takes one of the A's and one of the B's will give you back the original state. So if you trace out for B2, you will get back the original state that someone has given to you. If you trace out for B1, again, you will get back the original state that you, that you were given. So this is a great, this is, this is the, the basic question. And a little remark, if you're looking for these extensions, and this is why it's called extendability, these extensions, they are usually not unique. So you, you don't have to um, think that you might want find a unique one. And for NM a shareability, which is like the general case, again, you imagine someone has handed you a bipartite state and uh, you ask whether it's NM shareable. Well, if it is an NM shareable, if you can find a, a state on a much larger Hilbert space, such that you have N copies of the A Hilbert space and M copies of the B Hilbert space, and for any pairs of A's and B's, you will get back the original state. So you can, you can trace out, for example, AN and B1 in this case, or the other one. And if I had more pictures, I could do even more, but it will be boring. And this is like nicely written down here. So basically you want for any pair A and B, you want to get back the original state. Okay. <clears throat> so the statement is, that uh, for separable states, they are always uh, NM shareable for any N and M. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> and this is trivially true, and it's easy to see, but I'll still prove it just so that we get some <coughs> uh, familiar. Sorry, I, I'll have to cough because I'm a bit sick. <coughs> so I'm going to prove it anyway because we just want just to get some uh, familiar familiarity with the subject. So if you have uh, a separable state, you can write it up like this, that's trivial. And what you do, you just imagine putting in more copies of the state on the A system and the state on the B system. That's how you get N copies here, M copies there. And it's very easy to check that if you choose any uh, system AI and any system BJ, you will get back the right marginals. That's it. This is trivial. What's interesting, remarkably, is that the converse is also true. So if you have a state and you can prove that it is NM shareable for any N and M, then it will be a separable state. Um, we're not going to this. So on the other hand, if you have an entangled state uh, on this bipartite Hilbert space, it won't be NM shareable for every N and M. So there will be uh, some numbers where it breaks down. 
And I'm not going to prove this again. I'm going to motivate it by talking about the monogamy of entanglement, <clears throat> which I think is, is widely known, is that if, if, for example, if you have two parties which are very entangled between each other, then they cannot be entangled with third parties. And this is exactly what would happen with uh, shareability. So if you have uh, a state which is very entangled by itself, you cannot really uh, put more parties into it such that they also get very entangled between them and that the marginals are, are, are all uh, good, because this is monogamy of entanglement, exactly. To be a uh, bit more- Sorry, can I just uh, like comment for like students? So actually even like more refined statements are true, right? Because you, you can actually bound the distance <laughs> of your, uh, like uh, of a state that has some degree of shareability to uh, separable, uh, to a set of separable states. Right, uh, like the larger, uh, the more shareable the state is, the closer, the, the better you can approximate it by a, uh, uh, by a separable state. Uh, yeah, I, I think that is true, yes. I'm, yes. I'm not going to go into that, but yeah, that there, is, there are theorems about that. May, may I also add one? one yeah, one, go yeah, Because this is like, I, I, uh, I think what Miao said is, is true, and by the way, it goes as like, uh, one or if it's like one n shareability, its bound goes like one over n. And uh, what I want to ask is, if someone asks me, usually, I mean, I mean, if you talk to another physicist, okay, but what is this entanglement? It's just another type of correlation, and then you can always come up with this thing that any classical correlation or correlation that is not entanglement that you can share with arbitrarily many parties and entanglement you cannot and if you say this and it's very easy to for them to explain it that somehow then they start to sort of like feel that it's a very special type of correlation entanglement. thank, thank you Zoltan. okay uh, i will continue unless uh, I'm, I'm happy with the comments by the way so thank you very much uh, if no one has any other comments uh, just to be a bit more precise, I will I will try to, to precise what I mean by shareability number, uh, because of course for NM shareabilities or in this case let's change it up to KS shareabilities, you can uh, uh, talk about a partial order on these shareability numbers, and not every one of them can be compared, but they can be compared, and it's like a, you, you flip it a bit. Um, if you have a shareability number Q, a K and L, we say that it is smaller than k prime l prime if oh, i missed a, a prime here so if, if k is larger or equal than k prime and l is larger than or equal to l prime so with this uh, partial ordering if you have uh, uh, something that is larger than a lot of lot of uh, or, or something that is larger uh, than than some something else that will mean that it's more entangled that, that's why we have an ordering and um, the definition is that a state is uh, at most KR shareable. If it is KR shareable and there is no pair that is sort of, well, smaller for it, it is shareable. So you cannot cannot make a, uh, uh, it, it isn't, for example, K plus L, K plus one, L plus one shareable. That's like a, an easy way to, to think about it. And sometimes uh, when people talk about shareability numbers, since it, they are, there is no uh, good ordering on it, sometimes they only consider one L-type shareability. So you only take more Bs and Bs and Bs into the, the equation, but you do not change the number of uh, A Hilbert spaces. Okay. Now this is again a statement, which is that um, the maximum shareability number is a good state of measure of entanglement because it is LOCC monotone. And for example, well, this is basically easy to see, we proved it, that separable states are infinity and infinity shareable, so they can be shared with as many parties as you want. And for example, pure entangled states are only one one shareable, so you cannot um, put anyone else into, into the, the party or into the mix. Good. Now, still shareability number, uh, I, I tried to motivate why it's interesting because uh, as we will see, it can be calculated for some states, but it hasn't been calculated for a lot of states. So it's not like a, a magic uh, uh, entanglement measure whereby everything is solved and it's easy to calculate. It's actually hard to calculate, but it is, uh, 
it is sometimes uh, 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 so sometimes you can calculate it for states with symmetry, and this is where states with symmetry come in. Now, just so everybody is on the same page, uh, a quick reminder because I will talk about linear representations whereby you have a group G and you have a vector space V. And if you have a group homomorphism from G to the general linear, linear group of V, I call that a linear representation. And what it has to do, it has to preserve the structure of uh, the group. So if you take a group product uh, at, in the group, it will be the same as taking the sort of, well, either the matrix product or the composition of functions, uh, if you prefer, uh, of the, the images. Good. And some examples, again, just to remind you, because perhaps you're not working with uh, any representation theory. You have, for example, the trivial representation, whereby you put every group element to the identity. That's like trivially a good representation, but it doesn't tell you much about the group structure. For matrix groups, you can talk about the defining representation, whereby basically you are, uh, for every uh, matrix, you are mapping it to the matrix itself. And for example, for SU2, as physicists, we know very well that there are the, the different uh, spin representations, the J spin representations, for example, one half, one, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, and yes, again, the, these, this is some mathematics. It's not that important, but we'll mostly be using unitary representations, not just linear representations, because we will represent the group on Hilbert spaces and the we will mostly be using compact groups and therefore you, every representation can be made into unitary representation. That's not too important. Good. Um, so my definition of a state with symmetry in this case, uh, I try to generalize it a bit, uh, but we will see examples so that you can tie into what, what, uh, what, I, what I mean. Uh, if you have a state true on a bipartite Hilbert space HAHB, I say that, or we say that it is invariant under local symmetry if for a group G and for representations phi lambda and phi lambda prime, you get this equation. So it commutes with the tensor product of uh, uh, the representations for every G in the group. So this is what we require uh, that, so that uh, the state row is invariant under local symmetry. Good. And uh, one of the motivations, because I've said that we're looking at unitary representations, one of the motivations is that if I have a state already and I can find another state through a prime, such that they only differ by this uh, sandwich or conjugation by these unitaries, uh, we say that they are equally entangled because these unitaries basically only represent a change of basis. What we do here, it is we, we flip this on itself. We look at states that are invariant under any unitary. But to be more formal, we pick a group G, which is usually a Lie group, and we look. We may look at like strange representations because I will look into strange representations for one of my calculations. Now, examples, one of the most well-known examples are- Adrian, this, sorry, one clarifying question on the previous slide. This one? Yes, so you are using the same group element in the definition, but not for the motivation. Um, well, I'm, I'm using different representations. So I could imagine having uh, different, uh, like a, a homomorphism such that I'm mixing up the group elements. Such that I can you have the same group element there in your yes. definition. It is the same group and element. The but typo that the second representation should go into the Hilbert space B, but. Uh, um, this should go into the Hilbert space B. Yeah, you're very right. Yes, but, what, yes, but you're using the same group element and not the G prime. No, yeah, um, that, that's, 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 what, that's what I want. I want to use the same group element, but I, I can use different representations. Mm -hmm. And by using yes. different representations, I can get different unitaries for the same group element. Yes, but uh, just below kind of uh, in the motivation for equivalent yes. kind of uh, you allow different group elements. Well, so, you so have two copies of the same group acting in that you, scenario. You, you can, you're sorry, you can imagine having the same group element or you could imagine uh, so if you imagine U1 as being a group element and this being the defining representation, then 
yes, in this case, it's not uh, uh, written as it should be, but you representations are only um, interesting up to unitary equivalence. So you can basically uh, turn any unitary into another one. So you don't you, you needn't have to have every the same one in in both of the places. If you have if you have two copies of a of entanglement, you are yes. using the orbit of two copies of the group. Yes. To define kind of while in your definition about states with symmetry, you only have kind of this one group acting. Yes, that's it. Then if you are coupling what's happening on both of the systems. I mean, you could try, I think, you could try using two different groups and you would get a larger group. I mean, one of the things you could do is you could rearrange this tensor product as being the tensor product of uh, representations acting on a much larger group, which is uh, the, the tensor product of two groups. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, can I? Just want to be sure that. Uh, so, I, I'm fine with the definition, but I just wanted to make sure that that's really what you meant. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there is a mistake in the like a typo. I think what what you meant here, Adrian, is that phi lambda is going from G to GL H A, and phi lambda prime goes to the same from the same G to GL H B. Yes, that's what. That's, I mean. that's what you already mentioned. Yeah, we, we, we are through that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so can I just, uh, yeah, okay. I, I actually know definition of those like symmetric states and so on, and I, I agree with this definition. Just, uh, I, I okay, I know some motivations for study, let's say, uh, uh, such states, but I don't understand the, motiva the motivation that you gave here, to be honest. Like, I, that's, that's true that like states are equally entangled if, uh, they are related by action of local local unitary transformation, uh, but uh, like actually the definition you have uh, just to turn Marco's question a bit, like you have a very specific transformations actually that you are restricted because if you didn't have them, I, I mean that was like in the like you would get maximal mixed state as the only right uh, invariant uh, state. Like if it, if, uh, For this definition. You, you won't. I mean. Well, I just mean like if you had like independent groups, like one one group irreducibly represented on H A, another group irreducibly represented you, you, on H B, you'll get uh, just maximal mixed state, right? So that, that's going to happen. Don't understand yeah. the motivation. Uh, okay. All right. It it might not have been a great motivation. Uh, the 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 interesting part where motivate this motivation comes more in in a hand or or more into the forefront is when I will talk about the twirl operation, um, because and and these uh, states of symmetries, the twirl operation we will go into it uh, in a bit, is a useful tool that we can have, and. Uh, this fact that they are equally entangled will be very important. If you have a state and you twirl it, you will have another state which is equally entangled, but it will be a state such as that uh, it is invariant under this given local symmetry. Uh, maybe not equally entangled, but not more entangled. All right, not more entangled. Sure, that's 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 surely true. Uh, but that would be the statement of LOCC, right? Yes. And here you have an equality. So how how the two statements are equal? Um, well, here I have equality because yeah. that's what I I, I asked for. The Zoltan uh, questioned this equality here, whether or not these are e surely equally entangled. Yeah, they are and surely equally. I mean, look, what is written: two bipartite states are equally entangled if they differ only in local unitary. This is true. The question mm -hmm. is, I mean, this is not maybe a good motivation why we look at the states with symmetry. That was the question. I mean, that's true, yes. But what, what happens here is that, of course, we can use uh, uh, we can use the twirl. And from the twirl, we know that it has to be because of this, that they are equally, uh, if there is a one single unitary. So after the twirl, you know that the one that you twirled is either equally entangled or less entangled than the original one. Let's say that that that's, that'd be a partial motivation. Okay, okay, thanks. 
All right, thank you for the comment. I will go on unless someone else has comments. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, the examples. And one of the examples that I think everybody's familiar with is Werner states, where your Hilbert spaces are sort of copies of each other, or they, they, are, they are very, they are uh, isomorphic uh, Hilbert spaces. And I just, I just created a CD everywhere. And they are, so the Werner states are invariant under uh, unitaries on CD. So um, in this case, I didn't bother about uh, or with uh, representations because these are the, the sort of self representations or the defining representations of uh, the unitaries, whereby you take a unitary and you assign it, it itself. Okay. And the other one, which is an interesting one, is isotropic states, which are also commonly known which is a bit more tricky. They aren't invariant under this U tensor U, like the Werner states, but they are invariant under U tensor, the complex conjugate of U, whereby you mean an element-wise complex conjugation. And for that, you have to specify a basis and that's everything's hidden under the, the roof here. Uh, but basically it's, uh, it's invariant under this form of uh, unitaries. And, and in this case, you don't have the same unitary. Uh, okay, so let's go further. These were the examples. And the question is, why does symmetry help? So here I'm, 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 I will give you two reasons uh, why the symmetry helps with calculating shareability numbers. One of the reasons is that with symmetries, you constrain the parameter space a lot. So you have states with a few parameters. Usually, for in, in the case of Werner states or isotropic states, you only have one parameter. And that's much, much easier than dealing with high dimensional spaces and, and uh, trying to parameterize the, the state space there. The other reason is that we can use representation theory to find the extended state or the shared state. And uh, what can we do? So when, if you remember the definition of, uh, uh, that I gave for the, for the states invariant under a certain symmetry, basically we want to compute the commutant of a group of unitaries which has this form, or if you want to see it in a different way, a, group, uh, a state, uh, sorry, a group of unitaries where, I, where you also include the representations. And one of the tools you can use is Shaw's lemma, uh, which is again like a basic group theoretic tool. Uh, if you have the tensor product of representations, which is such that it decomposes into the direct, that's not sum, it should be sum, S-U-M, to the direct sum of irreducible representations. Uh, so in this way, where you have the direct uh, sums of irreducible representations, that might they might have multiplicities, you have to take that into account. If you are using Shaw's lemma on one of the irreps, uh, what you will get is that the, the commutant or the operator that commutes with uh, every, and here I'm, I'm, I'm hiding the fact that this is true for every G in the group. So the operator that commutes with it will be an, um, a, a multiple of the, of the identity. Now, what you have to keep in mind, uh, if you have no multiplicities, is that this row will be basically made up of these uh, uh, multiples of identities. But in general, you, you actually have, you don't think about them as identities. You think about them as projections onto the invariant subspaces that the irreducible representations act on. So you have something like this. And this would be if you have a shared state or if you have just a symmetric state, you can write it up in this form. And this is much easier to deal with because you have orthogonal projections and you have the sum of orthogonal projections. You can make them easily into the sum of uh, quantum states, a convex sum of quantum states. Okay. Now, the other thing you can do, the second tool is the twirl operation that already came up. So if you're looking at or for the, the commutant of this group of unitaries, what you can do, you can take any state sigma and you can make it invariant. And for example, for Werner states, what you do is the twirl operation that looks like this. You take a Haar integral and you sandwich or you, you conjugate it with these U tensor U unitaries and you inter integrate over the, with the Haar measure over the group. 
and it can be uh, proven, and I think my next slide proves it, that this is indeed an invariant state. So if, if, if you, you can't find a state, you take any state and you can sort of project it onto the, the, the set of states that is invariant under the symmetry. And as Miho pointed out, if you are very restrictive with your symmetry, it's possible that you will only get the maximally mixed state. Yeah. The proof, just so that, that you see this as well, if you have a twill operation like this, like for example, in the case of Werner states, what you can do is you can look whether or not it is indeed invariant under this uh, V tensor V um, um, operation. Well, basically you just follow along with the calculations. The, the Haar integral is a nice integral. It converges nicely. You can put in the, the V tensor V into the, the inside the integral. Now you can rename the integration. <coughs> you can rename the, 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 the measure under which you're integrating. And the trick is here at this moment is that while you're renaming, since it is a left invariant Haar measure or Haar me the, the Haar integral and the Haar measure had this property, you can uh, relabel it as uh, uh, DW. And in this case, you can, from the right-hand side, you can uh, get out this V tensor V, which exactly means in our case that it is invariant under it because it just passes through. Okay. So let's talk a bit about Werner states because there has been some results already, not our results. And uh, what can you do with Werner states? So if you apply uh, Shaw's lemma, what you get is that they have the form, uh, they have a form as, as being the, the sum of two projections, a projection onto a symmetric subspace and onto an anti-symmetric subspace. And they have only one perimeter. As I've mentioned, this is one of the, the reasons we like states with symmetries because it constrains the parameter space greatly. It has one parameter, uh, which is between zero and one. And it's not that hard to calculate that the set of separable states is uh, ones which have parameter between zero and one half. Now, sometimes they use different parameterizations because, well, sometimes different parameterizations are better. And uh, they use the parameterization with the trace of the flip. So if you have a, um, a Werner state, well, it, I should have put, instead of lambda here, I should have put the inside the trace of the Werner state with the flip. And the, the, this parameter can be between minus one and one, and the set of separable states, it can be proven, are between zero and one. The rest are entangled. Okay. And as I've said, I, there are some results already from Johnson and Viola, uh, who has a, they have a great uh, paper uh, about uh, extension problems. And they say that the one and shareable states are such that they have uh, this kind of uh, parameter, so between minus d minus one over n and one. Of course, we can check that the separable states are surely in this interval, but some other stuff can be in there. And they even, this is their uh, figure, uh, they even included this figure. I'm not sure, I think this is for two or three dimensions. It's for two dimensional labs, I guess. Uh, yes. Okay. So you get the, the one, one to two share abilities and it approaches zero and at zero, it's infinity to infinity share. Very good. Now they actually went further a bit. They calculated some NM shareability numbers. As I've mentioned, the shareability numbers do not have a good, nice ordering on them. They have a partial ordering on, on them, but NM share- uh, Sorry, Adrian, like in the previous slides, like those, uh... Let's say those intervals that they gave, it, like, are they tight in a sense that you cannot inc like increase the the length of the left? I mean, you can you cannot like ex extend this interval to the left more. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so they, they these are tight. Yeah, they are. I if see. if and only if. So, there. Yeah. This this isn't like a conjecture, or this isn't like you have to be at least this. That's mm -hmm. surely. So that's a precise uh, okay, result. Okay. Cool. Thanks. <coughs> okay, and uh, and uh, Johnson and Wheeler actually 
calculated for some dimensions. So for example, D equals two, D equals three, D equals four. For some dimensions, they have calculated what this uh, lower bound is. And in this table, if you're interested, it's actually minus this lower bound, which you can find. The other bound is always, sorry, is always one because the separable states will always be there. And uh, what you can see is that they did some calculations, but there are some stars where they didn't finish the calculation or they didn't do it. Uh, what this alludes to is that the, is the fact that Werner states in general are difficult to cope with. And in general, calculating the NM shareability is hard. For a given dimension, for given N and M, you can calculate it, but it's not, you don't, we don't have yet a formula for the general case. Now, just to show off a little bit our results, we can, for example, for the, the four dimensional cases, we can calculate it for basically any, well, in this case, it's all L and R, but for any N and M you want, uh, because you can do it by basically brute force. You can go through every one of the possibilities, but as N and M grows larger, it takes more and more computational time and it gets worse and worse. So of course, one of the, main goals of this research would be to find uh, an overarching uh, equation or, or, or a set of principles which would govern the NM shareability of Werner numbers or Werner states. But to, to, to show off even more for D equals <coughs> 3 and 4, actually even for 4 now, we have the general formula. And for, for higher and even proof for higher these, we hope to have a general formula, but maybe the proof is problematic right yeah so what, what we i will talk about this is my very last side line but i will basically say that we have conjectures proving that the conjectures are tight as you have asked me how that will be difficult and we're not sure that we can do that but we can give some conjectures where it's it's always true and whether or not you have some leeway we don't know or we will see if we can prove anything. but the equal three four we have it yeah the full proof and equal to as well that's true and by the way i'm mentioning this because it will be coming up in this werner like state and uh, you will see shortly why i gave a sort of more general way to talk about uh, uh, states with symmetries is because in this case i'm taking the group su2 but i'm actually looking at werner like states on cd tensor c2 and I'm denoting them rho d2, that's not that important, and I'm already messing up my notation. But basically what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, uh, the uh, representation, the irreducible representation on the d-dimensional uh, Hilbert space and on the two-dimensional Hilbert space. And I'm requiring my, uh, this Werner-like state to be invariant for every unitary in SU2. That's my definition. Now, two remarks. One of the remarks is, if you're more familiar with the spin representation, uh, the, the spin notation, I would say, so you don't, you prefer, uh, because here I'm using the dimension to denote every representation for every irre irreducible representation for SU2. For every dimension, you get one irreducible representation. It's the easy case. And, uh, but you can talk about spin representations. So if you have the representation pi d, that will be the d minus one over two spin representation. Or in the case of pi two, it will be the usual one half spin representation, which we know very well. And the other remark, which is what I've mentioned just a minute ago, is that for example, for d equal two, you get back the two dimensional Werner states, because that's just basically how it is. Because you have SU2, you have the defining representations or the self-representations of SU2. Good. So just so that everybody is on the same page, everybody remembers the addition of spins. So if you have two half spins, you can add them together and you have these strange numbers popping up, zero and one. Well, this is, and in general, if you have two spins, uh, adding them up means that you can uh, uh, add the values from the absolute value of G, J1 minus G2 up until G1 plus G2. Good. And uh, more formally or more precisely, this would mean that if you have two representations of SU2, uh, they are unitarily equivalent to the sum 
uh, to the direct sum of two irreducible representations, which in this dimension notation means that it's pi d minus one uh, plus pi d plus one. Okay. Um, yeah, this is what we have. Now from Shaw's lemma, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, if we had, when we talked about states with symmetry, if you have such a decomposition, you can look at Shaw's lemma, which will give you uh, the building blocks of your invariant state. And in this case, you will get projectors onto the invariant subspace of the first irreducible representation, P d minus one, and another projection onto the other irreducible subspace of P uh, d plus one. And I'm making sure that they have trace one, so I'm, I'm dividing by their dimensions, and, and these are orthogonal projections, so they are positive operators, and uh, therefore I can basically uh, parameterize my, uh, um, my uh, family of states, which I'm calling Werner-like states in this case, with just one number mu, which is between zero and one. This is sort of trivial, it's true, and it's easy to check and easy to see in this form. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find a shared form. And uh, if I have a shared form, you can, with the twirl operation, you can basically make it so that this is invariant under this larger um, symmetry um, uh, structure. So you're basically taking, so if it's an NM shared form, you can make it in in uh, in uh, very variant under uh, the n n tensor product of the first representations and the m tensor product of the second representations. And this is because of the twirl that was mentioned earlier. And again, with the Shure lemma, you can write this up as the sum of these projectors. Now you have to take care whether or not you have multiplicities. In this case. Uh, you might have some, and that might mess up some stuff, but it's not that important for us. Just imagine you 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 can write it up nicely with these uh, projectors. By the way, soon we will get into a case where you will, you have multiplicities, and you will see why they are bad. And yes, you, you have like n number uh, of parameters. Sorry, I just Go ahead. To, uh, sorry, at the end, I just uh, okay because. I got lost for a second. Then maybe I uh, I found what so the so I are you saying that okay if you have uh, the the state that is uh, like invariant under this uh, pi d tensor pi two representation, then you claim that if we have its extension, it it's always possible to find uh, extension that would have this symmetry. Is that the claim? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I think this is like. Uh, uh, okay, I see. Okay, and it's even true. Fine. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you are, someone gives you for a specific mu gives you a state, if mm -hmm. there is such a state that it is n m shareable, which isn't true for every n and m usually yeah. if it's entangled, but if if there is one, then you can twirl it and you can make it uh, into a state which mm -hmm. is invariant and which will have the same marginals for every a and b. Sure. So, sure. So That's... you uh, you twirl exactly by this tensor product. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. You're you're actually yeah. twirling by exactly this tensor Thanks. product. You're, you're welcome. Okay. So to continue, you have uh, in general you will have uh, for an NM shared state you will have big N or capital N uh, parameters. And what you'd be interested in is uh, and yeah we know that uh, every uh, for taking out every A and every B. Uh, Hilbert space uh, or every pair, you will get back the original one. That's the requirement of shareability. Now, uh, since you can write it up as sum of uh, these uh, projections, it's enough to look at not every one of the mu's. So you don't have to look at the, all of the parameter space since it's a convex combination of these projectors. It's enough to look at what these projectors uh, where they are mapped, so what kind of mu's in the original uh, state space are they mapped, and then you can look at the convex combination of these, and you will get the ones that are indeed NM shareable. So again, you take a st you, you you look at the state space that you have, which is this row D two mu, 
and you ask, what's the unshareable part? Well, you imagine that you have found uh, one state that is unshareable or states that are unshareable. Uh, they will have this form. And since they are the convex sum of these uh, projectors, what you do is you, you basically trace them back or, or look at what the marginals are uh, in your original parameter space and you take the convex sum of them and you will get the, 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 the subset of the parameter space, which is indeed NM shareable. Okay. And the trick is, is to do this is to find uh, uh, good uh, observables such that uh, this uh, uh, this can be done. So I will show you what I mean. Uh, if we use this observable, and it's not trivial to see where this comes from, but I will try to motivate it. Uh, there is two ways to write it. What I'm basically saying here, the C is the Casimir operator of uh, SUT. It's actually the quadratic Casimir operator. And I'm writing it up in the whole representation, in the representation which happens on sort of the, the left side or on the, or the A Hilbert spaces and on the B Hilbert spaces. And another way to write this up is to write it up as sort of the sum of uh, where you have identities everywhere except for uh, one of the A Hilbert spaces and one of the B Hilbert spaces. So here the sum goes such that uh, there won't be terms where both of the uh, representations are on the B side, for example, and also you won't have uh, squares. So you won't have, yeah, but that would also mean that both of them are either on the B side or the A side. Why is this great or why do we love it? Well, there are two reasons. We love Casimir operators because Casimir operators can help us identify which uh, representation we are in because of their eigenvalues. And we like this kind of operators because uh, uh, just because the, the shareability condition, uh, they will, these uh, large, large uh, observables will be the same as taking only for the original uh, family of states looking at uh, the, well, I will show you now, sorry, this is easier. I won't have to talk that much. So why do we like uh, observables where you have one operator which is non-identity on the A Hilbert space and one which isn't an identity on the B Hilbert space? Well, you can look at the extended state and you can look at the original state and exactly because of the shareability condition, it will have this, uh, this equation will be true. So you can look at the, well, sort of the marginal. And because this is true and because A had this form, which you just have to accept because that is true, uh, you can actually calculate the trace of the extended state with A and you will get Nm times this uh, uh, quantity in the parentheses. What you need to remember D is the, the dimension of the A Hilbert space and mu was the parameter. The N and M uh, actually comes from the fact that you have N times M number of summons in this sum. That's where it comes from. Uh, sorry, Adrian, just, uh, we are not uh, very strict on time typically, but sort of <laughs> roughly speaking, uh, like we are sort of finishing like 10 minutes. So like, if you can I will uh, speed up. manage to uh, sure. like squeeze it in like 15 minutes, because uh, I'm looking on your site number and I, Expect that it will be denser and denser. Yeah, I will, I will. I will. I will try to go in bigger steps so it's easier. So as I've said, the A on the other hand is great because you have these uh, uh, Casimirs. And what's interesting is that for a given projection, remember that we could write it up as the sum, convex sum of projection. For a given projection, you can actually calculate the Casimirs as being the Casimirs of the whole representation minus the Casimir of the representation you get on the left side or on the A Hilbert spaces minus the Casimir that you get on the right hand side. That will be equal to something and you will get the mu in here. Now what you want to do is you want to minimize this and maximize this so that you see what the minimal and the maximal mu can be. Because remember, we, we are projecting back the extended states to the uh, states we're, state base we're looking at. And this clever optimization to get the minimum and the maximum, you have to take into account that the whole, uh, the, the, the representation you get on the whole depends on the representation you get on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And this is the, the result. 
it's not incredibly interesting, but it is a nice result. So as you remember, mu could be between a zero and one, and uh, it's, it can also be calculated that the separable states are between uh, zero and one uh, minus one over D. And this is exactly what you get back because uh, uh, it's a bit tricky to look at the N unshareable because there are two cases, but if N and M are both going to infinity, this is zero or this is zero and you get back exactly just the separable states because you can forget about this okay let's move on the O states these are uh, i think again can be familiar yeah, in yeah, this uh, case sorry uh, adrian just don't go go that far i mean what is also uh, interesting about this <coughs> that uh, usually when we talk about nm shareability of course you could switch nmm because we talk about symmetric situations with respect left and right here it's not going to be like that that's uh, I think an interesting thing. Yeah, you're very right. That that's an interesting observation. That in this case, the two aren't interchangeable. So, for example, the the typical way they do one over one L shareability isn't that uh, informative in this case. So the OO states, as I've said, the OO D, if D is two, they are it's, they are the same, right? Yeah, because then you get one here or one here, and everything is. Yeah. But, and you get back the Werner states for uh, D equals two. So the OO states, as I've said, they are sort of, uh, they are, this is a remark, they are sort of the marriage of Werner states and isotropic states. I will think about that a little bit. Okay, and uh, what we require, because why we call them OO invariant states, because we require invariance under the special orthogonal matrices. And for example, if you remember your representation, so, okay, theory, somehow your voice is cracking. Oh. I don't know. Okay. What Give me a moment. I think my laptop is overheating. That's the problem. Oh. Can you can you hear me no now, Reza? Presentation. It's better. Now it's better. Yeah. No, no, no. I have a I have an old old laptop. That's the problem. So, so tell me if if I'm breaking up again. Okay. Anyway, we have these uh, OO invariant states where basically they are invariant under the defining representation of OO state, OO operators. Okay. And uh, well, the representation theory for orthogonal matrices is, is stranger than uh, the, for example, for SU2, uh, wait, wait, wait. especially so, in the. So OO means that, that it's like uh, it's not invariant with respect to any U tensor U, only if these U's are orthogonal matrices like the role exactly I mean, yeah like... you, you can think about it like that uh but we will shortly see what the parameter space so remember the parameter space space in the case of Werner states was one dimensional in the case of OO states it's two dimensional and uh i'm going to skip this i don't, I don't think it's that interesting this is interesting that this great triangle is limiting the parameter space of these OO states and this is in the n equals three crate case. I mean, the, when the dimension is three, or when you are looking at S O three, and the the dotted line represents the isotropic states, and the dashed line represents the Werner states. And this is where you see that they are sort of the marriage, uh, in in some sense, of the isotropic and the Werner states. And if you solve, for example, the shareability question for the O states, you get the, the answer for the Werner states as well. Okay, and this great triangle, it can be calculated that this is the uh, separable states. Okay, this is a set of separable states. So can we do the same trick as before, uh, finding like a good uh, uh, sum of the Cosimers such that uh, it's sort of... Uh, uh, breaks up into the summons of these two point uh, operators. You can't really do that, not generally, but we can construct, for example, the one two shared state and we can actually calculate the shareability for that. So what I calculated is the one two shareability of the OO states. And uh, I don't think this is incredibly interesting. Uh, I'll try to find something that's more interesting. Yeah, basically from Shaw's lemma, you will get again uh, a sum of these projectors, which project onto the invariant subspaces of the different representations. And these representations are labeled with these young diagrams, which might be familiar to you or might not be familiar to you. Just these 
uh, squares, don't worry about it. This is how we label the representations in this case. What's interesting is this red M. The red M actually represents a multiplicity, and that's a bit more difficult to deal with uh, in case of Shor's lemma. Uh, I will go back one slide just to see that when you are looking at the decomposition of this three tensor product, you get uh, these sums and you get two of the same ones. And something else which is interesting, I didn't mention because I'm running out of time, is that we not only require from the shared state to be such that it is invariant under this uh, triple tensor product, we also require it to be symmetric for the two Bs. So it's a one, one two shareable state, or one two share, shared state, so it's A, B1, B2. And what we re require is that it's invariant under the flip. Now, I would say that we don't require it, but if it's all invariant, <coughs> it automatically will be yeah. that. And, and so it, it will inherit this bigger symmetry and this bigger symmetry you put on the extended state as well, right? Yeah, it, yes, exactly. And that's why you have these labels of minuses and pluses, because uh, the pluses are a part of the symmetric um, subspace and the minuses of the anti-symmetric ones. So you get this, uh, this um, multiplicity, which is a bit hard to deal with. Anyway, now you want to find uh, uh, operators such that uh, they can be calculated for these projectors. And they can also be calculated for the initial uh, row, which was an O state that you started with. Yeah, this is exactly what I've written here. So you want to find A and B such that basically you get back the, the, the numbers that parameterize the perimeter space. And if you have for every one of them, you can take the convex sum of it and you can look at what part of the perimeter space is one to shareable. Um, okay, one of the other tricks which I won't talk about unless someone is very interested in it is we can actually not only deal with the SON group, we can bring in the SUN group to help us out because the SON group is a subgroup of the SUN group. And how this helps us, we can actually use the representation theory of SUN as well, which is a bit different than SON. And uh, we can look at how it, it looks the, these representations look constrained onto SON, and it, this will help us. And what we do in the end, just so that you can imagine, we used both the Casimirs, the quadratic Casimirs of SON and SUN to calculate these uh, magic A and B uh, observables such that uh, their trace with the extended state is, uh, is exactly the parameters that we want to calculate. And this is, these are the, the magic operators Okay, this is not incredibly interesting. What's interesting is that for the projectors which do not have multiplicities, you can easily look at where they are projected onto. And this is these red dots will give you, uh, if you if you calculate their trace with the small f or small b or little f or little b, uh, this is where you'll find them in the parameter space. So surely uh, the convex hull of these uh, five points, so this tri lower triangle, that will surely be one to shareable. We already know that. But there's something else. Firstly, we know that these, this uh, great uh, uh, rectangle has to be one to shareable because those are the separable states. And we didn't deal with the, the multiplicities yet. The multiplicities are a bit tricky to deal with because, the short, because of Shor's lemma, you get these, uh, well, super matrices or however you want to call them. And what you will get, I won't get into this, you will get this GIF that I will show you now. Hopefully you can see it. Tell me if you can't see any GIFs. So you will get an ellipse for the multiplicity part. So hopefully everybody can see. Uh, N here is the dimension. So I think I start with two or three, no, with three dimensions. The red dots are the dots that we've seen already. So it, they are the projections of, uh, so they are the where these projections get onto the perimeter space of the original uh, state space. And the blue ellipse is the one that we get from the, the multiplicity part. And you can see how it changes, how it varies, and of course, the separable states change as well. 
Okay, so this yeah, is. Yeah, I have a comment here. Don't don't, don't sure. take it away. So there is a lot of work <coughs> which deals with how, uh, in different dimension under these different constraints or for different families of states, the volume in 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 some in some measure of separable states with respect to the volume of uh, entangled states, how that behaves. And usually it's that the separable states volume is, is going like, uh, it, it, when the dimension grows, it, it, it goes to zero very fast in most of those measures. I mean, most of the fa families. And this you can see also here. I mean, if you, uh, the, the gray is the separable one, but interestingly, the one, two shareable states, they, they almost don't change their that, that volume. So that, that's also an interesting thing. Maybe for future so, studies. Can I ask? So this multiplicity space, Adrian, that you mentioned, like what is the dimension of this multiplicity space? Like, is it small, large, two, two? Okay. But yeah, two. So it's yeah, not two multiplicities. Yeah. Oh, you again started to overheat. Yeah. Uh, Okay, because like then, uh, yeah, I was suspecting this because the shape looks like, okay, I mean, maybe, like, because it's like a shadow in some sense of like a block ball, right? Exactly, Perfect. exactly. Uh, right. Sorry, actually, so look, the multiplicity state itself is two dimensional, but that means uh, uh, that that's the multiplicity space. So there is actually a block ball beyond that, the qubit, and that's exactly a shadow of that. It, that's exactly what it is. So, if I understand well, the the set of like all shep, uh, all shareable states would be the convex hull of the points in blue and red ones. Exactly, the one two shareable states will be the convex hull of the blue ellipse and the red points. Okay. I could have yeah. So basically, this lower half with this strange arc. That's the one to shareable part. Okay, and I will finish up. Hopefully, I'm not breaking up now. Uh, so the just just to end, I'm talking like one minute about the Werner states. We have the answer for SU two and SU three, and as Zoltan pointed out, SU four as well. I didn't include that. We have uh, brute force calculate. We can brute force calculate it for any d and any n and m, but it gets more and more machine heavy. And uh, yeah, as I've said, the general case is complicated and uh, yeah, it involves young diagrams. It's very strange multiplying strange young diagrams together. It's not pretty. We're trying to simplify it, but so far we only have conjectures. We have a lot of conjectures and we want to prove maybe for at least those conjectures that they are actual lower bounds on the, the perimeter space. And thank you for your attention. These are my sources. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Adrian, for uh, for the nice talk. Uh, we have some time for questions or comments. So, please, uh, yeah. I maybe have one. Please, Tomek. Uh, do you know if the shareability has any application in the algorithm, maybe in, in or in information processing in general? Great question, and I will I will ask Zoltan to answer if he's still here. I'm not. I mean, he knows. No, you you are here. Student, yes. I I mean I mean he knows way more about uh, quantum algorithms and applications than me. No, okay, okay. So yes, so I don't know. So I mean, maybe we should ask uh, uh, also someone else here. <laughs> maybe uh, someone else knows this. So. I don't know of that super direct type of applications. I mean, what I can tell you, uh, Tomek, for example, is that uh, actually those algorithms which are trying to look at whether a state is um, is uh, separable or entangled. I mean, there are these these algorithms. I mean, it's. Uh, in, 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 in certain sense, an MP complete problem. It also depends how you, you make the errors. They are actually based on this fact, for example, that they are trying to extend the state or, or, or make this a shareable state. So there, it, it, there is definitely some application. Um, 
we also talked with some people, I mean, at some workshops, because this pops up where they then might be like in a, in communication setting, some applications in, in quantum communications, but uh, I'm uh, not that much aware of that. So where this pops up usually is like, it's because it's a if and only if condition for whether you are infinite, infinite shareable uh, uh, on, on, on entanglement versus separability, like if you are separable, if you are infinitely shareable. And actually those, um, many of those algorithms that, sh that uh, provides you that this state is shareable or not, that actually, uh, uh, sorry, if, whether a state is entangled or not, it actually tries to extend that state in, in this way. So that, that is definitely use this concept. Okay, thanks. Um, and more questions. Great answer, Zoltan. Marcus, please. So one question I have is, can you include permutation symmetry? Uh, yeah, that's, so permutation symmetry, for example, for uh, uh, just two uh, so bipartite Hilbert spaces is basically invariance under the flip. So I didn't talk a lot about this. Wait, 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 uh, but, you know, I, I'm actually good. thinking a bit more globally that you start with a, say, with an n partite symmetric state. Yes. Or say k partite, uh, not to confuse the parameters, and then you want to extend it. You yes, mean, so you could. In the sense that, uh, that it's in the sector, <coughs> like, like a permutation. Symmetric, not not invariant, but symmetric even like. Yeah, kind of a thinking of bosonic systems, and you know them kind of on the small part. That would be kind of my second question. So, which is partly related. I, I don't know, Adrian. Maybe you want to say I don't want to take over. As I'm usually doing, but so no, no, it's it's okay. It's very comfortable when well, you take it. As much as I have a partial answer, maybe it's not exactly what you want. Is that there is something called? I mean, uh, first of all, this extendability is sometimes called symmetric extendability, but I don't like that term at all because you can always make it permutation invariant, not symmetric in the sense permutation invariant, the, 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 the B part and the A part, you just have to swirl it. But there is something called, um, uh, so, so there are two answers to your question. One is that there is something called uh, Bose, uh, uh, Bose extendability, which makes it such that the B part of your state is in a completely symmetric, uh, is still a completely symmetric state. Uh, and also it could be the A. And by the way, there is, we are also thinking along the, that term because this has not been done. This is, we think of this in terms of the definite thing to, to make it such that the full AB system is in the symmetric, uh, uh, when you extend it in, in the symmetric uh, subsystem, it goes beyond this shareability because there you have to use this type of Definite type of argument, but um, I haven't seen those actually. This latter one defined the both shareable. I I have seen. Since the other question I would have is the connection to the representability problem, kind of a, where you get effectively a pure state is your extension. Uh, and and how, how these two relate? That, that, that's the question. I mean, I don't know. And whether you can make a statement under which conditions you would get a pure state. So, this it's is a little great bit kind of asking for the, the marginals being kind of symmetric. And then asking whether this has a pure state kind of solution. So what I can tell you is that okay. So this question actually popped up when, when we were working on this, mostly with David. Not Adrian was not involved in those uh, discussions because for 
it's probably because of a different reason that you are asking. For our case, it popped up because we wanted to use this, and actually we are using it. That will, at least in David's uh, thesis, it will be. Maybe we also make a paper of that. We want to use it for the shareability things for um, many body physics. And in many body physics, you can use this uh, type of. I mean, this usually pops up that you want to have the ground state problem, and it's a type of. Uh, um problem on the representability in that context it popped up but actually we didn't go in the way that that we also want to have uh, like all the way that that the real representability question that whether there is a, a big pure i mean there is of course a big pure state then uh I mean, these are actually all 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 uh, interesting so questions. It was essentially out of curiosity that all oh, you can make a statement. Apparently not yet, but oh, maybe a direction. So, so can I just make a comment? So, so I guess looking for the uh, like a necessary condition for existence of such a pure state would be the uh, the existence of trivial representation. Of a group on this, uh, when you take those like many copies, because the state would have to be you impose it to be pure, so it would have to come like from a, a trivial representation of the corresponding yes, symmetry group. But there is a problem, Michael, with that actually uh, with this statement that actually we don't require like the the there could be a pure state. Which is not invariant. What we did that we, if there is a sure. state, we make this big twirl over all the. Sure, components. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I understand. So, so because I was sure. Okay, so there might be some pure state which is. Uh, yeah, you don't. It's not you don't have the symmetry. Yeah. Sure, exactly. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I understand. Thanks a lot for these questions, Marcus. These are really interesting. Some of them, typically, this Bohr's extendability and. And global Bohr's extendability, which has not been actually, this has we have been sort of covering, but like uh, we still want to finish this this uh, this research first. Okay, thanks. Okay, last chance for some questions to Adrian. Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Zoltan, for uh, visiting us today, although virtually. And yeah. Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, some of us have some work to do for QIP, so let's go and do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye.